This is a Design from Trust call. We are going to talk about words, framing, vocabulary, the history of words, etymology, <clears throat> which everybody confuses with entomology. So we're not going to talk about insects today. Um, our, our guide into the topic is Douglas Carmichael, whom I have known for uh, quite a while and who has a most interesting life and background and, uh, and brain. So Doug, I will just uh, pass it to you and uh, uh, take us in and we'll see where we go. Okay, um, I hope we have a good conversation about this. I'm gonna start out by saying something about why I'm interested in this topic. Uh, to me, I think our society is in a lot of trouble and we're gonna have to go through big changes and big changes on the order of uh, the end of feudalism, the beginning of the industrial age, maybe the reformation, which shifts it into the cultural space. And looking at words that we use in the current economic and political scene contain traces of origins that have been lost, but that might be good to be aware of because we might wanna go back to them. Uh, and so the words I'm going to look at uh, really highlight. I'm going to start out with the word economics itself, which I know Jerry has thought about quite a bit. Uh, what's striking about uh, this word, wh whose origin is pretty well known by economists, that is, it's from the Greek, ekonomia, uh, eko, uh, in some form meaning household, and nomia meaning uh, rules of management at that time. Uh, it was uh, structural. So uh, economics was used by the Greeks in the sense of household management. And household for the Greeks meant a state. Uh, and it was a holistic concept, which is really important. Uh, the, the people who wrote about economy in the uh, time of around uh, Athens and Plato uh, used it in a very holistic sense. So economy meant the household in every aspect, uh, the grain, the cattle, the land, the slaves, the wife, the children, relatives, uh, and its relationship to neighbors. What's striking is that by the time of Adam Smith, how much uh, the broader meaning there was lost. Uh, and that continued in economics, stripping out the human and the social in the search of mechanical models that were repetitive so that computation was possible. I want to think of the value of going back to the original sense of economy as estate management, where the estate now is the globe. It's where we live and it needs a full management. And I think the word economy contains implicitly that idea because it started as a holistic concept. Uh, there's a lot to say about that. The economy for household is pretty clear. The nomia, uh, uh, I know Jerry's been interested in the difference between ecology and economy. The nomos is man-made law. Logos is natural made law. So that one thinks of ecology as the way the natural environment unfolds and economy as the way the human-made economy unfolds makes a good deal of sense. But the word nomos for law has a really interesting origin in Greek thought, much earlier. Nomia meant uh, as law equal distribution. Uh, so the idea of nomia begins with a feeling of trying to create something. Now you wouldn't need a law if it was already happening naturally. So it suggests that in early Greek society, there was already a tendency towards inequality. So you needed to have law, a system of law to maintain equality among the, the people. This is really important in the way uh, early estates uh, were managed. I wanna look at the word capital, which comes in from the very beginning. <coughs> capital, comes from the Latin cap for head, as in the head of a nation, uh, the, the thing that's on top of a column, uh, the cap at the head, top of a column. But it also meant uh, a, a new head of cattle, a phrase that we still use today. How many head you got over at your place? 
It's the measure of wealth. Uh, it goes all the way through Greek and Roman society. And the cultivate, so these estates, the economy, uh, especially in Greece, were basically like Texas cattle ranches. Raising cattle was the main thing that they did, and eating cattle was the main thing that people subsided on which gets really interesting and complicated. If we think of early uh, hunters and gatherers going out as a group, making a kill, making a fire, and all sitting around and sharing in the eating of this animal. The idea of sacrifice, which is later, ritualized that process by uh, slaughtering uh, usually a cow, or a bull, and sharing it in the community. So the idea of sacrifice maintains the culture of the nomia of early Greek thinking. That is, it's a way of making sure that everybody participates uh, in the food. And we're talking about a lot of food. In the Odyssey, uh, when Odysseus is in his crew would land on an island, they would kill a hecatomb of cattle for sacrifice. A hecatomb is a hundred. This is a big deal. And uh, at the time of Pla Plato uh, in Greece, uh, in Athens, Athens had a herd of cattle, 100,000 head used for sacrifice. That is, would come in from the countryside, pay the priests to buy a cow, which is then sacrificed in honoring the gods. But it just happens that it gets distributed among the population. And this was a, a daily occurrence in Athens. Uh, I've been trying to pay something in, in chat, but I can't for some reason to get it to go. But let me give uh, a reference that's pretty helpful. Uh, a book by Jeremy McInerney, M-C-I-N-E-R-N-E-Y, -E 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 the Cattle of the Sun is about cattle in, in Greece, early Greece, and just a fascinating thing to read. So what's important is the idea that the community distribution of food is central to sacrifice and central to the raising of cattle, that is, cap. So you can see it this way, that the birth of a new head of cattle, a new calf, is capital in that kind of society. It was the measure of wealth, and it's what you managed for. Uh, and you can see how important then capital is in the beginning of Western civilization. Uh, a, another interesting book by Gotsman, Money Changes Everything, that was quite popular about a year ago, takes this back into Mesopotamia and shows that in uh, 4000 BC, the uh, Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, understood cattle and exponential growth of herds and could even do loans based on that understanding of growth. And the idea that if I let you some cattle, you had to give it back to me with interest. And the word interest in both Latin and Greek uh, is the same word that's used for offspring. So there's a nexus here of meaning around what the purpose of an early economy is that really hints at what an economy should be now. That is, it's the support of the population. What happened in the 19th century was the separation of economy uh, into the mechanical parts that acted like a solar system and the social parts which were to be ignored. Uh, and all in the uh, seeking to be more scientific and all that. Uh, I'm gonna go on to another interesting uh, word that builds on this, or a pair of words actually, private and property. Uh, property is a fascinating word because we all use it all the time. Where does it come from? Property comes as the same root as proper. And it meant things like, are you dressed properly for the meeting? That is, it was a sign of social rank, uh, like having a sword and a horse uh, in feudal times, was uh, property uh, showing who you were. That that became separated from the person and be something that could be sold uh, took a long time, actually. So property 
comes from social status, which I think is pretty interesting. Private is more complicated. Uh, private comes from Latin privatus, which means, uh, my Latin isn't terrific, but the dictionaries tell me, that privatus comes from to remove from the public sphere. So the idea of private is something that was public and got removed. And in Latin times, in Roman times, it meant that it lost its vitality because it was no longer part of the community. So something that was privatus was something to be mourned about because it was a loss. Totally different than the modern meaning of uh, private. Um, we could take words like technology. Uh, tech is normally treated as Greek for skill, craft, art, things like that, that are pretty late in Greek times, uh, fourth, fifth century. Uh, its earlier meaning was to engender. So that's why it's related to creativity and craft. But engender is again sexual. And that's one of the things I want to stress is that early economy and down to uh, hidden now, economy has to do with managing production, reproduction, sexuality. I think sometimes you see the, uh, the gleaming look in an entrepreneur's eyes when they're talking about opportunity. It's really they're thinking that they're conjuring with basic forces of the universe, uh, sexuality and reproduction, but it's unconscious. Uh, so, all this to me hints at what we need to understand about economy now, because it's lost all of its social meanings. So economy basically is the autonomous moving of money around in a society for the benefit of the rich, not for the benefit of the society. And understanding that laws might help us understanding where we could go to uh, in a better future. And I think we just are going to need that. I think we're in such deep trouble. Uh, and the only way out is going to be through major cultural change. And we're all terrified of that because it seems to imply a kind of authoritarian basis. And I'm stuck there myself. I don't know quite what to do about it, but it's what I think about a lot. When so you say stuck, that, Doug, when you say you're stuck there, what do you mean stuck? I think we're stuck in early lock-in to uh, an ownership society, uh, a split between workers and capital. I mean, the idea that we have capital that's owned by some and not everybody is really weird when you think about the history of economy in Greece, economia, uh, equal distribution. Uh, we have no principle of equal distribution now except trickle down, which doesn't work. And especially it's not gonna work in an algorithmic society because like the horsewhip people went and worked in factories uh, when the horses were gone. Uh, that's not happening now because if we need new jobs in this economy, there are Stanford undergraduates who are already trying to write algorithms to do that job with a computer, not with a person. So people are competing with something really new that wasn't true with technical changes in the past. So, uh, you know, and the, you've got to take it that the economy that we have uh, is wrong in the deepest sense because it's killing us. It's taking our planet in the direction of global warming that maybe we cannot avoid. Uh, the obvious thing is that the econo economics we have, notice economics is interesting. Economics is the description of an economy. Uh, I'm going to round on a little bit here. Most societies do not have these two words. In French, uh, economy is, is both. Uh, it, outside of the West, there, people don't have a word for economy. So they have to make it up if they're going to be in dialogue with the West about it. In China, for example, the two characters that they've picked to, to replace the word or to, in translation, to translate the word economy, shows classical texts, that's one character, being pushed forward in history is the second character. So in a way, 
if we think of economy as household management, that is how to make the whole thing work going forward, uh, the Chinese equivalent has somewhat the same sense, but is more deeply cultural. Economy, I think we would be better off if the, we'd never had the word. Uh, it, in, it, in, it implies a coherence among stuff uh, that's false. Uh, it's an economy is not a coherent single system. It's a conglomerate, a, an assemblage of many changes over a long period of time. So I'm going to stop there and see what kind of conversation we get into. Well, well you said go ahead, Anna. The two characters in Chinese. Anna, we can't hear you very well. Your voice is breaking up a bit. Sorry. Can you hear me now? That's yes. better, thank you. Uh, you said the classical, the, the two signs in Chinese was classical what being pushed forward? Classical texts, like uh, Lao Tzu and Confucius, classical texts. Oh, I see. okay. It's, it's, the, it's the character for those. So in a way, what, the way the Chinese have chosen to translate the word economy is into moving their culture forward. Yes. Um, um, I could throw something in. Go ahead. If, Please. Yeah? Um, mm -hmm. I really apologize about the. I'm between meetings, so I'm sitting in a hotel. <laughs> so you're going to have to get a close up here. Um, but um, super interesting what you're saying. Thank you, Doug. Um, I find that it's quite interesting. Um, Jerry and I had a little conversation about language. Uh, where I have a very strong opinion about if anyone is going to be able to change the political scene that we see now very strongly in the US and in the UK, uh, but also in the rest of Europe, so most of the West really, uh, if anyone is going to change that successfully from the left or the right, they're going to have to invent a new rhetoric because all the language that we use now to describe has such strong connotations that it just becomes a mud war between the two sides. I so, completely agree with that. And if you look at the difference between Western language, which tends to like rigid, well-bounded concepts, very different than the Chinese. I've been learning Chinese for the last four or five years, and it's just fascinating. And because the Chinese much prefer a fluid boundary between concepts compared to the way we do it. So it's easier to evolve Chinese than it is. I mean, we're not going to give up these words like the, the current use of economy as mechanical systems. No. Um, the continuation of, uh, of that in the, say, on the political spectrum um, is an observation that uh, the people who are trying to change rhetoric now and even trying to change economy through sharing economy, through um, social entrepreneurship driven by large businesses, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting that, uh, that innovators are being brought to the forefront with a new language based on the old language, unfortunately, but still with a new language that the public actually believes because it's rooted in sharing and in community. Um, so I think as a comment to what you're saying, something is happening, but it's very interesting that it's coming from business and not from society, where society should really be the representatives of community, which they're not anymore, and businesses are known to be individualists making money through capitalism. Um, I'm quite into the whole social entrepreneurship and, the, and that side of business. Um, and there are some very, very strong forces there, but uh, there's also a huge culture and that also lies in the public that will be very, very difficult to change. I don't know if anyone has any comments on that. 
I have tons of comments, but I'm going to hold back for a little bit because I'd love you guys all to, to jump in. I have, I'm, I've made a long list of things that, to jump in with, but I, uh, Travis, Peter, you guys too, if you want to um, take this wherever you'd like. I'm going to try to throw something in and not be too discontinuous with previous comments. <laughs> I like what all of you are saying. Um, I think that when we're talking about... Um, we're talking about culture. Culture are shared patterns of meaning making that we have as so the stories that we tell ourselves about how we relate to each other in our world. Um, and language is of course part of an important part, essential part of how we tell those stories. It seems like, you know, the kind of planetary crises that we are confronting right now, we need new stories. Um, and I think stories are a little broader than language, though I really like how Doug is describing the stories underlying the language and how they come about. Um, from where I'm standing, I don't see how um, we will be able to kind of usher in a new set of stories um, with the status quo um, as we are. I think maybe this is what Doug was saying when he doesn't see a way forward. Um, however, things do change pretty rapidly when you have uh, big exogenous shocks to the system. Um, and that seems like what we're setting ourselves up for. Um, I think one of the questions that... Can, can I interrupt for a second there? Yeah. Uh, the way you use the word exogenous, uh, I think is a bit mystifying because it says that it's kind of out of our control. Uh, the things that are causing us problems are endogenous to the system. They're with us. We're part of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, slip of the tongue <laughs> but i think uh a slip of the tongue that is uh not just uh it's it's there it, it was slipped for a reason <laughs> um you know we're so inundated with that kind of uh language you know it's part of you know one of the um maladaptive stories that we've told ourselves is man's separation from nature um and you know that that we are somehow apart from it and i think that when we think about exogenous that's one way to look at it um so um, where I was going with that was just that I think we need to be ready with um, stories that are uh, more, I don't know, regenerative, more holistic, um, being ready for when, um, for when some major shocks to the system um, get to a point where there's a possibility of those stories being taken up more. Um, so how do we become better storytellers um, and <laughs> watching our language, such as the, what you were just saying, Doug, about exogenous. Well, let me build on what you're saying a, a little bit. I, I think that if we look at economy over the, the uh, thousands of years, since 500 BC in Greece, it started with narratives. And the narrative structure in economics comes all the way up basically through Adam Smith. Then it starts getting mechanized. Uh, in the quest for political uh, hegemony uh, by a small number of people. Going back to the stories then is a, uh, as the model in what it was like in the past. That's why I say economy for the Greeks was a state management. It was the whole thing which we have lost so much. Now, here's the problem for me. Let's say we start getting better narratives. How do they help people break out of things like the ownership of capital, uh, the narrow holding of land in the world? I think we need land reform of some kind. Uh, the rich aren't going to give up the riches that they've got without a tremendous fight. That's what really uh, scares me uh, in the context of climate change, uh, which I think makes everybody more entropic and less coherent in their actions. So I'm really puzzled. I think that understanding the organic ba basis of what an economy ought to be really highlights the fact that the task in the future is to feed each other. We're going to have to really think about that, and we're not prepared at all. Uh, I live in a pretty agricultural place. And the agricultural people here have no idea what's coming. They just don't. You're muted, Travis. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, I still, I think we need to, I, I don't think that there's going to be, that we're going to get off course or get back on course without, you know, 
basically being forced into massive disruption and upheaval. Um, and I think that there are ways that we can start to tell stories that, that connect to, that start to kind of lay the path, to, start, to, um, start to point the way in particular directions. And it's not like I know, like personally, like I don't know what the pathways are necessarily, but I've, I found myself kind of really looking at a lot of these planetary crisis in the past uh, couple of years. And uh, there are like, I think some entry points. Um, I just had a kid a couple of years ago. Um, and that is probably one of the only ways where people in their actual lives can have a reorientation towards what it <laughs> to, you know, intergenerational concerns. I think that's an entry way to start telling stories. Um, I think that, there's there's some movements that they don't go deep enough like you're talking about like land reform and all these kind of things that are so deeply entrenched even our monetary system um has a <laughs> very poor basis um but you can kind of get some surf superficial levels um so there's things like financial independence um that are ultimately at the core anti-consumerist um, which starts to get you to reflect on consumerism while not necessarily discarding all these other aspects. Um, I've been thinking recently about, um, is there a bridge, like looking at some of the um, crises we're likely to confront in the next couple decades, um, it's hard to predict when. Um, things like thinking about a retirement account um, or a 529 plan, these things don't make sense that much anymore looking forward. Um, so are there ways of like converting, like what's the story connecting what it means to be preparing for your future for, for security, which isn't really going to be there um, for your family? Um, what is it? What's like a, what's the next, um, what's something that's, that's um, more interest bearing in the future? I think you might be able to tell a story about um, uh, regenerative circular economies there um, and productive soil and these sorts of things. I think that the slow money movement is, a, is an example um, of starting to cultivate some of those stories. Now, those are examples where people are, um, are kind of laying the groundwork for something. It's not being taken up widely, but there are different points in people's lives when they're looking at these planetary crises where they might start prepping. And at some point it might hit some tipping point where it takes on a much uh, wider, deeper force in society. Um, uh, I know where you're gonna jump in. Yeah, could I just comment on that? Please, then uh, after that. First, I'm saying, Jerry, would you send all the comments that you're creating afterwards? Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to reply to what Doug asked Travis and then also to what Travis said now. So, Doug, you said, uh, how are these narratives going to help us change this mindset of aggregating wealth? Uh, from the top all the time, or that's at least how I heard it. I can't remember your exact words. And then Travis, you responded with um, uh, the perspective of crisis ahead and what am I going to do to keep my family safe, etc. And I just wanted to contribute with a, uh, the perspective from uh, a psychological point of view. Um, and you have to stop me when it gets all too woo woo, um, but. What actually drives capitalism and that mindset where you keep aggregating wealth when you've actually created it already. So say you've got a bank account with $200 million, you still think that you should work 16 hours a day and create more and you're not sharing because it's for you and your family. That is actually a scarcity mindset driven by the fear that there isn't enough. Um, and so now we actually have true crisis all around the world ahead, which could spark more fear and uh, more scarcity mindsets. So in order to get away from that, there is only one thing that will work. The only thing that gets people out of poverty, out of a scarcity mindset, because well, they only really got eyes for it when it's about poverty and not about wealth, but it's the same thing. The only thing, is human connection. The moment you start building more human connection and you realize that you're not in this alone, uh, you build community, which funnily enough is what 
Doug was saying that economy comes from, that it was for everyone with the sacrifice, et cetera. Once you start building, building that, that little scaremonger on this side that keeps saying you must aggregate more wealth kind of calms down a bit until he dies, she dies, whoever it is, it dies. And I just think that's interesting because many of the initiatives um, that are being driven now, like share, sharing economy, the word says it, is about community. Social media started creating um, lots of communities. That's then gone a little bit haywalk, and that's probably because we still have the old mindset. So new ways of building community, whether that's through narratives and new language or what it is we do, I think that action must be there to build the human connection, otherwise it won't work. I think uh, it's important to look at historical examples of how what you're saying could possibly happen. One of the very few, I think, is the rise of Christianity, which was a stress on human relationships and a relationship to God. Uh, and it was powerful and, and tore apart the old society and helped build a new one. I think that what we're going to have to go through is as big as that uh, in terms of its shifting uh, our whole feel for what reality is and what counts. I'd love to think that it could be done in a positive way. That is the idea that we return to estate management. Our task is to manage the globe for the good of everybody is a pretty compelling story potentially. Uh, I don't know how to tell it. Uh, yet, uh, but I think that's uh, kind of where we need to go. But I'm very struck by how both of you are saying things which imply a lot of time, uh, decades. I don't think we have decades. I'm thinking whether things like the caravan coming up through Mexico is the kind of an event which could trigger uh, worldwide repercussions. I mean, what's going to happen to those people? That story will dominate the next couple of weeks. Uh, are there opportunities for that? I know when Princess Diana died in the automobile crash, the worldwide sympathy for her was amazing. It's like, where did all that come from? How do people in India, uh, in uh, southern Chile, wherever, understand who she was that they could all react emotionally that way. And I think that a better future is gonna to have to build on something which is already latent in people that we need to ferret out. It's not clear to me um, the time scale of what, um, I think what Anne was describing and what I was describing. I think that these things need to ha like will happen quickly. Um, because like you're saying, like we don't have that amount of time. We have like a decade at this point. Uh, Doug, uh, Peter just put uh, the Chinese characters for Jing Ji, or, and I don't know tones. Is that the, uh, is that, the, can you see the chat? Uh, I've got a chat window open, but it's not showing for some reason. Let me close mm -hmm. it and reopen it. Puzzling, puzzling. Oh, there we go. Whole bunch Excellent. of stuff. Oh yeah, we've been chatting like crazy. I've been, I've been sort of uh, summarizing what you've been saying and other comments, so. So I've got to put my glasses on in order to read this little tiny stuff. Excellent. Yeah, the yeah. character on the left is the character for, for classical texts. And it's got the thing on the left-hand side of the left character is thread. And underneath uh, is a thing that actually represents an old trowel. And so it has to do with uh, the work that holds together a culture. Wow. Uh, the character on the right, uh, the top part of it on the, on the right means standing, and on the left is uh, the three things that look like commas, means water. So it's the flow of all that as a work moving forward. So those are the right characters. Love that. Thank you, Peter. Um, before I jump in with a couple things, uh, Doug, could you talk a little bit about uh, cattle and chattel? Yeah, it's it, it just historically, it's the same thing. Chattel was, a, a, in a way, a miswriting of cattle. Uh, very similar. 
uh, the fact that, that uh, uh, in Rome, uh, cattle was the measure of wealth, so it was used as collateral for loans. Uh, there was not money in early Rome, uh, right up through the Caesars, so everything was done in notational script uh, around cattle chattel. And so, and so the original meaning of cattle back when was more than cows, was like it could go beyond you know, what we think of today as cattle, which is only cows, right? It, it kind of broadly meant your assets? Uh, yes, although uh, in practical terms in, in Greece, uh, there were no markets. Uh, that you couldn't go to a market and buy a tin pot. Everything was made in the economy of the estate uh, with a small amount of bartering and trade on the ages, but very small. So cattle was the measure. Uh, you know, you had the bride price uh, was of giving a certain amount of cattle to the father for the loss of the daughter. Uh, what's uh, a bit shocking is the language for uh, the way cattle were handled and the way women were handled was quite similar as for slaves. Uh, they were all treated as assets of the male owner. And that's, that's kind of exactly where I want to head um, because there's a couple other books I want to bring into the conversation. And I think, I think this, this whole thing threads together really interestingly. Um, uh, and I have several different angles here. Uh, Marvin Brown, uh, in the East Bay has a book out where he talks about how Adam Smith, um, a, a couple things, Adam Smith uh, was in Glasgow. Glasgow was very wealthy because it was the best protected port in the British Isles from those miserable French and Spanish raiders. Uh, so Glasgow gets really wealthy for trading with the Americas. Uh, there are three commodities that make Glasgow really wealthy. The, most, the biggest one is tobacco, which Sir Walter Raleigh popularizes in England and takes over England. Smoking becomes the, the, the rage. But, there, but, but Smith's uh, funders, his backers, his patrons are the tobacco lords of Glasgow. Uh, the second commodity is sugar. The third commodity is cotton. Those are the three commodities coming out of the new world that make his whole world really fat and happy. Um, and yet, uh, Marvin points out that Smith fails to write about slavery in The Wealth of Nations. So he's basically writing what we think of as the Ur economic text, and he doesn't talk about the thing that is fueling the economy that he lives in, which is just like really striking to me. Then I'll bring in a second book, which is The American Slave Coast uh, by Ned and Connie Sublette, a couple. It is a beautiful book, and I thought I was already kind of hardened and jaded about how terrible slavery was and all that. They posit that uh, nobody in the American colonies could imagine America surviving without slavery. They could not imagine the economy. Uh, Aetna in Connecticut was selling uh, life insurance against slaves. Uh, Rhode Island was the slave shipbuilding capital. New York was financing cotton, shipbuilding, everything. The North was as complicit as the South. And they say that the American Revolutionary War was actually a successful civil war. That the, that, that the whole story about no taxation without representation, a noble independent cause, was actually a cover story because Americans couldn't conceive of their economy without slavery. And the abolition happens in the UK before it happens here. So I think, I think that's all correct. And when you listed the three things, tobacco, sugar, uh, I think that actually a major part of trade was slaves. Uh, uh, yes. And well, and, until the abolition of slavery, Britain is completely complicit in the slave trade and, and the British ships are many of the slaver ships. I mean, the great uh, houses in England were built on slave, uh, the one in... Uh, uh, what's the popular video from the last few years? Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey. That house was a slave house. Built with wow. Slave How, built with slave labor, as was the White House. Too, slave in the US. With, with money from the selling. Money from, from the slave trade. So, so all of this, and then, and then if we bring in David Graeber's uh, debt, the first 5,000 years, um, where he talks about how early money was for incommensurate things like a bride price, or like a slave, you were buying a human life. That that money wasn't it wasn't for buying that pot. It was really for buying these incommensurates early on. 
that gets really interesting. And then I'll bring in another book, which is about the rise of consumerism. Uh, I think it's called The Origin of Everything. And it says that the abolition of slavery leads to a rise of consumption because before slavery gets abolished, wealth, and, this go, and I wanna tie this back to what you were saying earlier, that wealth was cattle. I think wealth was chattel and it was humans and slavery. That, that really, how many humans do you control was your measure of wealth until we abolish slavery and oops, can't, that's not so, so socially good anymore. Then it becomes shows of ostentation. Then we get luxury goods, then we get um, wealthy people start buying things and places and spending money so that others can see their status. So status is no longer how many humans do you control, but how much money do you have? And then there's a bunch of other stories that flow in here that help those people get wealthier and help them create lock-in so that wealth continues to trickle to the top, you know, the top of the economic pyramid, um, but that, which is a, a different story. But I just wanna explore this, this territory of uh, slavery, humans, uh, value, shows of status, uh, the, all these things connect pretty well yeah. together for me, but none the of these things, none the of these things are well known. The word property as what's proper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show, show social rank in society as a key thing to do in order to maintain your power. Uh, Hannah, jump in. Yeah, um, yeah, I think we've just definitely lost the meaning of the, well, the connection between property and proper. Um, but I just wanted to comment on what you said, um, Jerry, from that book, uh, that they could not imagine the economy without slavery. And I just have to comment that that is not such a foreign thought today. Um, I had a sort of tragic comical laugh about uh, Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon who came out to say that he wants to be a philanthropist now. He wants to uh, spend all his millions on the greater good. And I just thought, well, maybe you should put your own house in order first because he literally employs slaves um, who are not allowed a single break and who has to work however many hours um, without going to the loo. They sort of piss in bottle or whatever. Um, so I think a lot of the economy is based still on uh, the modern type of paid slavery. Um, it's almost an insult to people who were set slaves to call it slavery, but I hope you see the point of the comment. Thank you. And I just think that's a very hard nut to crack because obviously the ones who have the most if we continue in that lingo slaves or very poorly um, people working in very very poor conditions those who have the most have the most power to change but they are also the most resistant to change so how do we crack that one i'm not sure language is going to be enough so that's so that's another thread i wanted to weave in here which is um to people of privilege, any of these changes look like loss. All of these changes look like loss. And, and there's, there's like relative and absolute stuff you have, right? If you have a lot of stuff, often you want more stuff. It's sort of a competition against others, so it becomes relative. It's not like, it's not like we work until we have enough that we're not going to die, and then we, then we get busy helping other people. Not at all, otherwise nobody would make more than like $3 million if you put that away you can live off the interest and you're good and you're good everything over that amount is surplus that that you don't really particularly need um so so how did we get into that position one of the things about rich people is that they don't do not have surplus money all their money is doing something and if they lose some they've got to reconfigure their whole portfolio that's not true if they gain because it's, just, it's much easier to add in than to take out. And the richest people are actually quite anxious about loss because they're gonna to have to do the hard work of reapportioning their portfolio. Well, worse than that, worse than that, they could suddenly go from being high status individuals to being below, to being low status, to being negative status individuals. If society flips on these measures, 
we're, and there's already, of course, protest movements against the, 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 the one percent and Occupy and all those such things. Those are signs of the people with pickets at the door. Nick Hanauer does a very nice job of saying, hey, wealthy people like me, um, there are going to be people with pitchforks in the streets if we don't straighten this thing up. He's, he's, he's like really trying to come at this by talking about the issues. Um, but, but I wanted to come back, I lost my thread a moment ago, but I wanted to come back to this notion of everything feels like loss because it also ties into Me Too and Black Lives Matter. I think these, are, these things are all threaded together because for Me Too, men in power are like, well, shit, there's only X number of positions. If we start opening the door up and be equal about everything, then we lose power, status, control over a, a bunch of humans and stuff like that. So they can't, they can't really go along with the program because it just feels like loss. Hannah, go ahead. Well, I would tie it back into psychology and say it's still the scarcity mindset. So in the scarcity mindset, anything that you've accumulated, uh, that you then have to pass on is a loss and it's the only way you can see it. So again, human connection, anything like that um, will, will help. But I think we have some very strong examples. Um, it's not a case I've dug into, so I don't know if there's a backstory that I'm not aware of, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But if you look at Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, who at some point gave everything away and then rebuilt it, they must have had a very strong belief that they are good at making money so they can do it again. Also, they must have been aware that they've already built a very strong network that will help them rise again and do something. And I'm sure also they didn't give everything away so they had something to invest still. But some way, if, psychologically speaking if you if you're very well connected to yourself if you know yourself well if you dare trust the community you're in then it doesn't matter if you lose everything i've personally lost everything several times in my life and it's not sent me into some kind of frenzy uh, because i know i'm very good at making something again um, so it's a very fundamental difference between a person who is well-grounded and well-connected, so has a great community, and then this person who is probably quite removed from self and feeling of self, and therefore thinks, I have to run all the time, otherwise everything's going to break down. Um, another book I really love on these topics is The Great Transformation by Carl Polanyi. Um, I've got a short video out on, uh, on TGT, and um, he says a lot of really genius things, in, including how we lived before the Industrial Revolution. So he's, uh, and, and one of the things uh, uh, I just remembered uh, where I was going with Polanyi, um, one of the things Polanyi says is that the word poverty, the concept of poverty is new in about 1650. Um, that before 1650, we might all die of the plague, we might all die of a crop failure, we might all die because there are Huns on the hills and we're not gonna be able to run back behind the fortifications in time, granted. But the idea that one family in the village is going to go sink under and maybe starve to death because they don't have a job and they are poor, uh, doesn't, doesn't, it's not part of the culture. And then unemployment is a new word in about 1750. And there are two kinds of unemployed. There are the chronically unemployable, people too disabled to do useful work. And then there are the unemployed who must be pressured to go find work because there's this general feeling in capitalism that unless the threat of you know, mortal imminent doom is in front of you, nobody really wants to work. That's another story. So there's a series of scripts and stories that have been built and sold to us that form the current kind of economics that we're in. And, and sort of this, this, the story, Doug, that you started us on here is, is in many cases been marketed to us by a lot of people. One of the, one of the interesting side notes here, uh, Barry Lynn, the guy uh, who got kicked out of the New America Foundation uh, because of Google funding and all that, he's tracked um, the history of how did we go from treating citizens as consumers and he can point to the philosophers who have influenced the economists, who influenced the policymakers, who influenced the politicians, who basically set in, set in motion all of the different things. And when you're busy protecting consumers, what you care about is everyday low prices. 
when you're busy protecting citizens, you care about freedom of speech, you care about fairness and equity, you care about a whole bunch of other things. And so, so all the things we're talking about are the modern story, which has eaten our brains. And since we don't know much history, we don't know what life was like before. So the story of redistribution, and I really like the idea that sacrifices were in fact part of the redistribution, part of the feast, the, the, the common feast uh, thing, because I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it that way at all. Um, but I also, one last thing, I also happen to believe that sometimes things catalyze very quickly and that we can go from seeing one way to seeing a different way in, in very, very quick order that the question is what causes it to cascade, what causes it to, to trickle across society and, and to catch fire. And these days we've seen through, unfortunately, the negative uses of social media and so forth, but things trickle really quickly. I, I watched instant messaging go from being a weird geeky little thing that only a couple thousand people were using to being absolutely mainstream in two years time probably. And uh, no early instant messaging company spent a dime on marketing. None of them spent any money on marketing. It was just a tool so useful that you were motivated to infect all of your buddies with ICQ, AIM, uh, Yahoo Messenger, whatever, you know, these, all these early tools. So all of a sudden, everybody's got instant messenger. How do we do this for a radical story about the regenerative economy? And I think all of us know a whole bunch of people who are working very, very hard to get that done. Uh, we just don't see any of them that have actually caught on and caught fire yet. Well, I like the idea of calling it a regenerative economy because it takes us back to sexuality and reproduction and the generative, and the, uh, which I think is maybe one of the places that people have deep beliefs about that could be built on. Part of the problem with the messaging is it's the kind of change that builds on what is without threatening anybody in the process. Well, we're talking about with social change yeah. really requires a major loss of something by a significant part of the population. And my feeling is that it, that penetrates way down because the major resistance to climate change change is people afraid of losing their income. Uh, they can't see where they could be. In they're the also... Climate they're also afraid of losing their social network. So I actually think the big fear here is of loss, as be loss of belonging. And the far right worldwide has created a series of narratives that are all connected together that don't make sense to the left. They just don't make sense. It's like, how could you possibly believe that bundle of shit? And yet th that package of beliefs are part of membership in a group that give, and, and we really want to belong. So part of this, I think, is about wealth and not losing your wealth, but part of this is about status, con community connectedness, and the right, since Gingrich, basically made it so that if you step out of line, you are cut away. You, you basically are ostracized from the herd. The, the right does not have a lot of tolerance for dissent from the right, although I'll say their, strat their tactics and strategies are incredibly um, creative these days. Hannah, I just saw your note about having to go. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, so, so sorry to, to, to jump in while, as you were talking, Doug, but I think this is as much about the social soft side of community and belonging as it is about the hard stuff about, hey, I might lose all my savings or I don't know how else to make money. And, and I will add that there's one way of looking at this about not threatening the people who will be affected during this change. The thing I'm trying to crack in my head is how to have them see that life might actually be a lot better through this change, even for them, which requires seeing them in a different light, not as the other and the enemy, but as a productive part of the change, but that their lives will be improved at the end of it. And that I may be really consumerism needs to be repurposed as a loss of, of like the, the Latin privatus to remove from the public. Mm -hmm. Private means to be dead. Well, and a, a really big piece of the right is libertarianism, which is basically the, the, the peak philosophy for the things you're just talking about, where private property is dominant, the ownership society is what we want, free markets, uh, we'll fix everything. The invisible hand will sort things out. Uh, we need, you know, as little government intervention as is, can, can, you know, humanly possible. And sort of the, the libertarian Bible. And, and 
there's, there's a, a group of anarcho-libertarians, or I don't know exactly what the category name is, who see that traditional libertarianism is missing any part of the human social side and are trying to bolt that back on. And I'm unclear who that is and what, you know, whether, it's, whether they're succeeding or not. Because I, I agree with their critique, the government is too big and has basically interfered in too many things in our lives. Wow. So much to think about. I know, I know. So many little little Pandora's boxes we could just open. And, and, and for me, part of the problem of the rising of a new story is it might not be one that we like. Uh, I think a, a fairly obvious future scenario is, is lots of mafias. And yep. I, I don't want to go there. So my fear, for one of my current fears, for example, is that uh, fake news and the post-truth era is not a four or a 10 year uh, detour, but rather a 200 year era that much as romanticism was backlash against the enlightenment, um, you know, and World War I basically showed us the enlightenment wasn't actually going to solve everything, but in fact, you know, that, that these, this, these new, new technologies could be as hideous as they were cool and progressive. Um, I think we could hit we could hit 200 years of not knowing what's true anymore because uh, you know deep fakes and all this kind of stuff we haven't seen how that plays out yet. Right. Peter, do you want to jump in voice wise, or are you in a place where you can't uh, can't speak? I'd love to to know how all of this is crossing your your radar. I think we have a photograph of Peter, not the real person. Is he that turned right? off his video. He was on video very briefly, but um, uh, he may also not be standing next to the mic anymore. So, yeah, go ahead, Doug. I was just going to say, uh, I, I couldn't figure out how to post it in chat, but at my website, which is DougCarmichael.com, there's a link to keywords. I already posted it to the chat early. Oh, good. Okay. So many, many more. That yeah. Play with. And, and send any other links you want uh, or tell me now and I'll look them up and post them to this chat. But I'll, I'll send the chat to the list, to the whole list, uh, as well as a link to um, the, U, the video when it's on YouTube. So we can all refer to this. Um, I mean, partly the good news is that I think a lot of people see this. I mean, if you look at David Bollier's work on commoning and, and Silke Helfrich and a bunch of others, and then all the people working on regenerative economics, um, they're, they see the things we're talking about and they're busy acting on it. Um, the, the problem is that you know, there's, there's decades and decades and decades of critiques of capitalism and consumerism, none of which have ever won. Uh, I look at the postmodernists at Lacan and Derrida and Foucault and, and uh, Deleuze and all those people. I, I never took a philosophy course in high school or college or anything like that, but you, you, you can't miss that their critiques were actually quite accurate. They were saying, they were saying extremely uh, perceptive things. It's that the problem is they ended up saying them only to themselves because their language got so stupid and arcane that they marginalized themselves almost out of existence. It, it, it was too easy to make fun of the postmodernists, so we end up with popomo. I, th I think that's only one example. Um, like you can look at Marx's critique, where you know um, revolution is inevitable. Um, you can look at Paul Ehrlich's population bomb, um, green revolution, kind of pushed that, kicked the can down the line. Yep. Um, so I, I think what's different this time around um, is that these. Uh, the impact of our ecological exploitation is, is going to be um, <laughs> coming to bear. So that all the externalities of those systems, just both the social and the ecological systems um, are, the bills come and do. Um, at, one point, at one point does ecolo ecological disaster trigger activity on the far right so that we all are pulling on the rope in the same direction or does it ever? It might not ever. Yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the weird ironies here is that, is that our, our biggest billionaires all have projects to populate other rocks. They basically all have space travel projects, uh, partly, I, I believe, from the belief, the common belief that we've already screwed up this rock and are probably not going to save it. We had better populate other planets or satellites or something. You know, we better get off this rock or we're all going to be extinct as a species. 
which I think is A, a really cynical way of looking at things, and B, um, I like to say I've, I've read enough good science fiction to know that you don't want to be on the first thousand spacecraft leaving this rock. It, to me, the fact that, the, that these rich people want to use our money to get away from here is really hilarious and disastrous. Mm -hmm. I think it points to the weakness of our education, that they can hold on to such ideas contrary to what the science itself tells us about how hard that would be. About how hard it would be to settle other places, you mean, or what? Yeah, to get out of here and go somewhere else. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's inevitable that somebody's going to be terraforming something out there, and uh, and and we'll, we'll at some point that happens, right? And and it's it's just like fifty years from now, people will look back with with a little chuckle at the at the days when humans actually piloted cars and owned their own cars. That will be a like it will look as antiquated as when we look at a an 1890s uh, film reel and see horses and buggies in the streets. So uh, what, is your, what is your favorite movement, actor? Who's, who's got a piece of this right? We've mentioned, we've mentioned a few of them, but can we get a little more specific? Um, Who's actually pushing on this in the right ways? I, th I think what's been said in a way hints at the fact that a lot of people are, many, 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 but it doesn't cohere into a solution. That's where we're stuck. And the, the different solutions don't pull together. So you have donut economics and you have the 2% solution and you have creating shared value and you have, I, I, I collect them all and I put them in my brain, right? And they each have kind of a different yep. process, a different metric, a different, they're, oh, I forgot, uh, integral and all of the, you know, uh, teal-oriented stuff, holacracy, uh, you know, th th there's a whole bunch of these, some of which end up sounding more like religions than, than, than you know, viable my, movements. My favorite at the moment is Andreas Malm, mm -hmm. M -A -L -M, who wrote a book called... Uh, something about this gathering storm, I've forgotten, I don't have it quite right, but the storm is in it. And it's basically saying, given the pressures that we're under, we've got to move to an authoritarian solution. And hmm. the hope is it can be a soft authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Very smart. And here's another book, which I'm in the middle of, uh, called Climate Capital. Or maybe- Fossil Climate. Capital? Fossil Capital. It's an mm -hmm. amazingly good book. Uh, he's wow. really smart. He's young. Uh, I would watch him very carefully. Very interesting. Yeah. Travis, any, any, um, oh, hey, one more I want to add. Um, and it's a little on the solution side, Roberto Unger, who's in the law school at Harvard, all his courses are online and videos and YouTube. They're quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. His basic view uh, which is that advanced production in like Silicon Valley has a spirit of cooperation and learning and innovation that is held very, very narrowly in the business world so that most businesses are still old hierarchical structures. He says the, the positive future requires that we distribute that model of advanced production to the whole world rapidly and that it makes a tremendous difference uh, because those people are then given the right to innovate in their local circumstances, which is what they're gonna need. I just posted a link to Unger in my brain. I've got a lot of stuff on him. Yeah, he's really good. Um, the three kinds of work. Work is an honorable calling, which offers dignity and role fulfillment. Work is instrumental, that offers no dignity or authority, and work is transformative vocation the struggle against existing limits of society, for example. Super One interesting. Of the things that Unger raises for me is the question of uh, all of our hopes about how things could change. Leave out the question of leadership. Do we need an elite? If so, how are they selected and how are they rewarded? Uh, 
what's really striking is we pay a lot of attention to economy, but very little attention to political theory. Uh, people don't know things like the difference between democracy and republic. These are words we throw around without really understanding them. Capitalism, democracy, trust. Yep. Uh, it's, it's just amazing how thin the soil is over these words in our culture. Um, one of the things about leadership, I, leadership to me is a fascinating subject. And I, every now and then I'll say things like George W. Bush actually was a pretty decent leader. Um, I don't agree what he did, but how do you take the world's superpower and throw them into a war, a $3 trillion war with a country that didn't attack them that is halfway across the world? That's leadership, right? Well, <laughs> and, and, and well, no, it's leadership, misleading and, and et cetera, et cetera, is, is a form of leadership. So, so, and I think looking at Trump as a leader is a really interesting exercise, super interesting exercise, because I put a bunch of videos out a week after the election in, in 2016, where basically I said, wow, uh, as far as I can tell, Trump's path to squeezing a, an electoral college victory, what he did was the only way a guy like Donald Trump could have become president. It, it, like, for, as a small example, Trump could not have survived a single debate that was actually a debate. Right? Ted Cruz is a Yale Debate Society champion. Hillary Clinton knows all the facts, can clearly win a debate. So Trump knew, and I can see him just sitting there brainstorming, you know, with, with, his, with his Twitter thing uh, a day or two before each debate. Like, what am I going to do to this one so that everybody's talking about what a, what a crap head I am for the, for the three days following the debate and nobody worries about what was said in the debate? So I believe that Trump understands new power. Uh, Jeremy Hyman's just wrote a book about new power, and I'm not sure I, I, I like the framing because it doesn't explain Trump all that well. But I think that Trump understands new power better than anybody else did in the political sphere, and I don't think the left or the press have figured this out yet. And I'm very concerned that the far right is just gonna continue on its role until we figure out what is the antidote to these methods because trust has been weaponized, um, a whole bunch of things are happening, and that, unfortunately, is a form of leadership. All of that, all of that is leadership of the kind, uh, of the opposite kind of the kind you're looking for, Doug. And the leaders that I think we here on the call are looking for aren't awake and aware of those methods, and they don't have a good answer, a, a good response, other than standing on policy points that sound like they came out of the 70s or 80s. Is it your understanding that the people who could have been good leaders opted out of the leadership ladder early because it was just too daunting or dangerous? Or no, I'm, I, I fear I have a more negative uh, take on it, which is that almost nobody near circles of leadership understood the new dynamics and nobody figured out countermeasures. Yeah, I, mean, I, agree with you. I completely agree with you there. And the failure of the progressives to understand the people who voted for Trump is one of the great intellectual failures of our time. Absolutely, absolutely. In the, in, in the videos I recorded, I say, I don't think that everybody who voted for Donald Trump is a misogynist, racist, homophobic asshole. I think there were a whole lot of people who agreed with Bernie Sanders, for example, that the system is actually broken. And they hired Trump in the jobs to be done framework. They hired Trump to break the system. Right. And he, today, October 22nd, 2018, he's delivering. They're happy. His, his little base of 30% or whatever the number is that just won't shift, they're happy because he's delivering on that particular promise, which is not a promise anybody on the left, most people on the left, can internalize and deal with. I mean, we really don't even have a left at this point. There's no we, we have a fragmented left. We have like 12 lefts. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no articulate uh, alternative to Trump that meets his issues. Yeah. And the fact that Hillary's talking about running again. She is? Uh, yeah, it's been... Uh, Can't be serious. Uh, unfortunately. Can't be serious. That family, Chelsea shouldn't run. The Clinton family should step out of politics for good. Absolutely, um, but they're not going to do it. And Ride uh, their horses off into the sunset and just like live with it. Wow. So That's crazy. Well, look, this has been good. I don't know quite how to follow up on it, 
uh, to me, the issue, one issue is how hard it is to get people interested in the history of these words. Uh, yeah. I think critical, and it's a mindset to see that words have histories. It's a, a different mindset. I think we'd like to think that things are exactly what they appear to be, and they're fixed and rigid, and so an economy is an economy, period, end of discussion. Mm -hmm. So I'm, um, If you were inspired to write another blog post or whatever, and then share it with us on the Design from Trust list, that would be great. Um, whatever other things, that, uh, this has been really good because I didn't realize how many things I've been worried about actually connect. They, they, you know, the, the thread I did earlier with Adam Smith and Marvin Brown and the sublets and all that, like, like I, haven't, I haven't sort of put them all together like that before. Um, and I think I'm more worried than before about the lack of comprehension on the left of the issues and how to find an adequate response. I mean, the only, one of the few insights I've had is that to Trump and people like Trump, attention is oxygen. Attention is oxygen. So, and this, this hit home for me when the day Mitt Romney tried to stop Trump and Mitt goes in front of the cameras and he says, Romney's a terrible person, blah, 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 don't vote for him. And then, and then CNN shows for an hour, empty podium, Chiron across the bottom, Trump to rebut, on the left, a couple talking heads, American flags. For an hour, it's blank. And then they give him an hour of free airtime where he pimps his hotel, eviscerates Romney, goes on to say how great his campaign is. We've so, we sort of saw, I think everybody kind of watched that in horror. Um, and he rolls over Romney like he's just a little bump in the road, like he's a groundhog. Um, in retrospect, I wish that Jeffrey Zucker, who unfortunately is sort of in bed with Trump, but runs CNN News, um, I wish he had said, hold the cameras, turn the cameras to me, stop showing us Trump halfway through his hour, and then say, you know, my fellow Americans, we've been hacked. Um, the guy we've showing, we're showing you right now has figured out how to use us against you, and until we figure out um, these dynamics, we're going to show you a lot less of him. This is, um, this is also the um, attention as oxygen um, has a great parallel to um, media business model as well, because of course, attention is what makes money um, for a dying industry. Um, so there's an implicit um, or structural, I guess I would say alliance um, there. So um, and it's real hard to imagine how to break out of that. And that could, you know, so Trump understood that the media could not shut their eye. He understood that their business model required them to be frozen in front of him and to show everything he was doing. And, and as long as he didn't do something so awful that he was going to get blown out of office, he could keep pushing that envelope. And at some point, we're so accustomed to him doing crazy stuff that he has license to do crazier stuff. It's really, it, it's this really insidious dynamic that is still playing out that other countries are using. You know, Bolsonaro in Brazil is about to be elected president of Brazil, and he is somewhere between Trump and Duterte. He's like crazy. He's going to go like order his militias to go kill people. And Brazil is happy because Brazil has had a murder spree. Um, my buddy, Jamey Cassio, uh, kind of a, a, a member of some of our conversations here, he just gave a speech in Brazil a couple uh, weeks ago, and they did a poll. They had, everybody in the audience had a clicker, and they said, who are you voting for, Bolsonaro, uh, Haddad, or, or somebody else? And they voted, and 94% of the audience was voting for Bolsonaro. 1.7% were voting for Haddad, and 4% were other. And Jamey voted for Haddad, so he figures there's only two other people in the room who pressed the button for Haddad. Amazing. Like, like a shocking percentage. Anyway, we've gone a long time. I'd love, uh, I'd love to wrap our call, but any, any concluding thoughts from either of you? Uh, just say thanks to Doug. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed all the um, unpacking of uh, a lot of that language, particularly property. <laughs> the, the list that's on my website goes into a lot of other words, and it's amazing how complex it all is and fruitful, I think, 
in the best sense of generative. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, books uh, was, I can't remember his name, like Williams or something on his keywords book. Yeah, Raymond just, Williams. This, yeah. this moment, I typed it into our chat. That's very funny. What's and interesting Doug, is, is, is uh, Williams, I mean, it's really good to read, but a lot of keywords are not in there. <laughs> yeah. Doug, what's the one you mentioned? I bought it, but I'm not at home. It's sitting on my counter. I think it's Antal, A-N-T-A-L. Uh, is the author? Yeah, let me get up from my chair and look at it. Yep, I just, I, I have it at home now, but uh, no, it's not on Tal. Uh, let me just, uh, real I can't quick before. No, it's Ito, A-Y-T-O, Dictionary of Words and Origins. Excellent. I will put that in the chat and then we can wrap our call. I can't believe I'm on a, on a chat with three people who coincidentally have read this book. I think I'm the only one. <laughs> who <laughs> I'm used to like having seen this. <laughs> well, I bet you've read some other interesting things, which I yeah. About. You know, one of the things about our time is the stuff that's being written is really quite incredible. It, very, very good stuff. Uh, Agreed. It's all there. We're just not pulling it together into a, an alternative. After every cataclysm, you can look back and find people who saw it coming and who described it. I mean, uh, the big short is a really good example of this. You know, Michael Lewis finds six people who made a fortune from the disaster would never want to go back and do it again. None of the, none of the six, they, they, it, it broke their spirits, like, because they were hated by everybody, you know, going through the process. But you can always find somebody who was saying, you know, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, we're mostly not listening to them uh, in the run-up to these disasters. Right. The scary end of the Big Short was uh, the I can't remember the guy, but you know the one who was like the drummer, crazy guy, and they're just like, well, his next thing that he's shorting is water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, damn it. Well, really appreciate this conversation. I will post it to YouTube. Doug, thank you for taking us in so beautifully. Um, open to any more of this. And also, I will say that uh, from the perspective of our conversations, uh, Sylvia Clute, who does um, uh, a, a version of restorative justice that's much more interesting, is called unitive justice, has taken a, a long look at language as well. So I'm going to build a similar call around Sylvia, and we'll have a you know, similar conversation that'll be really different. Um, yeah. Because... Uh, she has uh, a lot of observations that are that are right in line with what we've been talking about, and yet in a parallel universe. Good. Okay. Cool. More soon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Take care, everybody.